John, honey. He's out there. He was in the foyer there. I got to hook up the mic. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm gonna... Listen, I made up the sheet on the picture, John. Yeah. Oh, what? I what? Scene by scene? No, the uh, sheet. Oh, I don't want to be ahead of myself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. The wacky guys in their second marriages and the gals who love them. <laughs> John, I have some ideas for that script. <laughs> Did Mark tell you that I, I loved your scene? I thought it was very exciting. I'm, I'm so, I can't even tell you how much that means to me. I'm serious. Let me tell you, Kensley, Larry Gelbart's never heard that. <laughs> I didn't hear this great announcement. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, uh, thanks. We're going to take you out of the light here. And, uh, you know, I haven't been in this room before, so you'll uh, forgive me. And if uh, you see somebody darting around uh, taping the show uh, digitally, uh, it's a friend of mine I'm working on a movie with now. It's a great sanctuary, this library. It's really great. And... Uh, uh, the, uh, the library system in America was a place I hid out when I was uh, poor, and uh, um, I lived at Sunset and Figueroa. I used to go to the main library with my dad's card and my card, and I'd get six books on each. And, uh, uh, you know, living dreams down there it was wonderful. But, you know, which of course is a, uh, a very prejudiced remark on my part about uh, rock and roll music, you know. It was Woody Herman who said, rock and roll is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and when somebody said to Stan Kenton, I just saw a rock band, he said, don't tell me, four guitars and a cannon. <laughs> so, anyway, so I go up to Minneapolis, having his dinner, and he's honoring as the man of the year, uh, two men of the year, uh, Billy Graham, some of you remember him, you remember flattering remarks he had about the Jewish people when he compared notes with Nixon, remember that? <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, Billy Graham, you remember, born again Christian. And uh, Jimmy Carter, who won the Nobel Peace Prize recently as a born again Christian. Uh, in fact, George Bush Sr. who said, if you had the opportunity to be born again, why would you come back as Jimmy Carter? Remember that? So I go to Minneapolis, and they honor Norman Schwarzkopf, you know, who originally, you remember, uh, conquered Iraq in 48 hours, and uh, then had uh, culminated the war in uh, four months of parades. Remember all that? He got hired by NBC. Well, I went to do uh, the Larry King show one night, you know, and, well, you know him. He's been with us so long, you know, and uh, uh, he's up there, you know, and... Uh, he has two guests in the hour, you know. I read parts of your book all the way through, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he lives here. Nate Niles every day. So uh, he says, uh, the guest on the first part of the show is Mark Furman, who broke the Skakel case. And, uh, uh, and of course, was in the OJ case, this humane detective in the LAPD. So. Larry King says, you know, you have to sit in the green room before you go on. You have coffee and chips of turnips and all that. So I talked to Mark Furman, you know, and he says, uh, the trouble is that everybody's on welfare and they're looking for a handout and tough guy. You know. So uh, after the show, Larry King says to me, how did you find Mark? He wants everybody to like everybody, Larry King. It's like when you go to your aunt's house at Christmas. <laughs> they want you to like everybody. And of course, the, well, anyway. So he says, how did you find uh, Mark? So uh, I said, how did I find him? I found him rigid and somewhat unyielding and obdurate. And Larry King said to me, you missed it. You missed it. He's just a lonely guy. I said, he is? Larry says, profoundly lonely. So, well, you know me, I'm always curious. I said, why do you think he's so lonely? And Larry said, how would you like to be the only racist in the L.A. Police Department? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I can't, I can't take it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, if any of you come up Beverly Glen to the top, to Mulholland, to the, what we call the Glen Center, you know, that's where I write my movies, at that corner center table, in longhand. I'm a writer, too, you know. And uh, the way I became a writer was uh, totally a freak of nature. It was an accident, and uh, I uh, was uh, lured into it by uh, Warren Beatty, who, uh, whom I once said, I said to him once, who do you find a mature, responsible, moral woman? And he said, Madonna. <laughs> so uh, I've known all these guys a long time, you know, a long time. So in the community, so anyway, Warren, uh, Warren hired me to uh, write a picture based on a book I'd written, which is in this library, Heartland, which he thought was terrific, although he has never read the book. <laughs> and as he said to me in a burst of candor, a book that good I don't need to read. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, not to, uh, not to uh, digress, so I did a... I did a lot of, <laughs> I did a lot of uh, unlikely writing, and then I, I reached uh, my uh, crescendo when I came uh, to the attention of uh, Mr. Avelson when I was working for Eddie Murphy. And uh, Eddie Murphy is remaking all the Jerry Lewis pictures. And uh, I remember saying to Eddie Murphy in all seriousness, can you live long enough to duplicate this body of work, which I think is a real challenge. So, uh, uh, and then I wrote a movie for, I actually wrote a, uh, a movie for Jerry Lewis. And uh, I remember this because Jerry Lewis said to me, my son Gary, you know, his kids, the regular kids he had, are all like uh, 60 now. And uh, <laughs> he said, uh, my son is a Republican, he drives a BMW, and he, has a wine cellar and collects certificates of deposit. <laughs> How could that happen to a guy like me? I said, I don't know. It's a kind of a strange. Do you think uh, maybe this kid is a mutant because you used recreational drugs <laughs> at the end of the 60s? You know, I always look at every possibility. So uh, anyway, we try to write this movie for Jerry Lewis, and we couldn't figure out what to do with him. Because if he had his druthers, he would still play a bellboy you know, drops dishes and all that. And he wanted to remake the jazz singer, you know, and drive people out of the temple again. <laughs> and so uh, I finally said to him, why don't you play yourself? So we made that movie from Warner Brothers, and uh, Jerry plays himself in it, and all the stars play themselves on a telethon. It's really exciting. You know? <laughs> and. Uh, it was shot on digital tape, like we're shooting tonight. You know about that. It really minimizes cost. You just shoot with available light and available talent. You know? <laughs> so this helicopter is coming down the strip in Vegas. So you're in a helicopter, and it looks like we're flying through Jerry Lewis's window. That's the magic of, of movies. And we're uh, going through his window, and he's getting dressed for the telethon. And... Uh, um, Ed McMahon is talking to him and everything. And as he's getting ready to go on, there's a knock on his door. This is before the credits. What we call a tease in the film business. And uh, he opens the door and there's a guy there with a bag. And he says, who are you, Jerry says. And the guy says, I'm Dr. Leonard Feldman, Jerry. I've just come from Cedars. I uh, have a cure for muscular dystrophy. <laughs> Oh, well, Jerry says, uh, that's wonderful. Of course, there are many lonely people who are waiting for the show. And, uh, you know, the harmonic cats are ready to go on. So he kills Dr. Feldman. <laughs> anyway, uh, listen, before I go tonight, I, wanna, I noticed how you all responded 
to my uh, friend Woody Allen. You know, I've known Woody for almost 44 years. It's hard to believe. December 1st, he'll be 67. So uh, people like Roger Ebert can resent that when he kisses a girl in a movie. You know, you can't do that. You're not supposed to uh, have any feelings if you're <laughs> over 40 in America. So uh, they're really after him, the critics. You, know, you notice that. Uh, if you really want to find enemies, just cultivate your constituency. Uh, so anyway, uh, Woody and I have been pals back from when he started out here at the interlude up on the Sunset Strip, and he worked at the Hungry Eye in San Francisco and everything. So uh, uh, anyway, I, you know, we see each other intermittently, and he's the only person I met in the film business. And I worked with some really, you know, titans, Paul Newman. And he's the only guy that's totally self-effacing. You ask him what he likes, he tells you how good Fellini is or Ingmar Bergman. He doesn't, uh, uh, he never talks about himself. So anyway, I, uh, I pick up a copy of The New Yorker. And as an interview with Woody, in order to plug uh, the new movie, The Hollywood Ending, the last one. So in the interview, he says, uh, he talks about everybody. And he talks about me. And uh, he's so giving, he's so generous. He says to me, uh, uh, to the interviewer, he says, uh, Mort doesn't know it, but he changed my life. You know, I was walking around San Francisco, and I was a comedian, and nobody liked it, or not enough to validate my doing it. And I felt low, and I stumbled into a dump called The Hungry Eye. It had 83 seats. It was dirty and cold. And there was a guy up there in a red sweater with a newspaper talking geopolitically and psychobabble. And he said, uh, no one was laughing. That was a style I developed. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for noting my contribution. And he said, but I could see you could go your own way. And uh, more changed my life. So I thought, wow, this is fantastic. So I call up um, uh, Miramax Pictures, which is releasing the picture. And I get Harvey Weinstein in there. And I said, uh, uh, is there any way I could get a message to Woody? No, there's no way. So uh, I said, can you tell him? I don't know. I don't know. So uh, this guy is kind of a, he's a tough negotiator. And I wasn't asking for anything. <laughs> you know Miramax, don't you? Harvey and, and Bob, the two brothers, and they make foreign pictures here in America. You know them, don't you? These guys are great. So he says, uh, he, he says, wait a minute. And I hear him talking to the press agent. He says, it's Mortzall. He says, well, tell him to come to the screening. Maybe he'll see Woody. So they have a screening of the movie, and they have a party. So I go to the party, and the usual drunks are there, you know. <laughs> who don't know what the picture's about and everything. And I'm looking for Woody. So he's way in the back with Sun Yi <laughs> eating. And he's got this army jacket on and a fishing hat down here. Very reclusive. So I walk up and I start to walk over to him. And this guy comes over to me. It's like a rock and roll guy with the rope on Sunset Boulevard. Where are you going, pal? I said, I have to talk to Woody. I'm a friend of his. Ah, no, no, no. So I said, you're not his bodyguard, are you? I, could, I don't think I could live with that. Woody Allen is every man. He, you're not a bodyguard. Come on. He says, he's given a lot. He's made 36 pictures, and he was dragged through the courts by Mia Farrow, and he finally found love, and we owe it to him to let him enjoy it. So I said, you got a lot of sensitivity for a bodyguard, you know? <laughs> you should be writing. Let me call Avelson. So... Uh, he says to me, all I know is you're not going over there. So I said, would you tell him I'm here? He says, what's your name? So I start telling him, he says, I don't remember names. <laughs> I said, will you, will you tell him, you know? So the guy says, all right, well, I can't remember your name. What do you do? So I said, I know what you can tell him. Tell him the guy that changed his life is here. How many people say that, right? <laughs> Give me I'm the guy that changed his life. So he says, okay. He changed your life. I said, no, no. I changed his life. 
got to get this right, you know, and deliver it. So I rehearsed them and everything, you know. And uh, he walks up to Woody, and Woody's like, yeah, yeah. He turns right, does a double take. He says, there's a guy standing in the door in a sweater, and he says he changed your life. So Woody takes off the fishing hat. And he runs over to me, very paradoxical, if you know how laid back and reclusive he always is. And he grabs me in his big bear hug, and he kissed me on the cheek, and he said to me, can you change it back? <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Howdy. There you are. Everybody say hello. I'm Julia, a big fan. Hi, we thank loved you. it. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to wait. That's all right. right. You're great. We heard you laugh in there. We knew. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we appreciate it. You're in there with all senior citizens? <laughs> in the back, of course. What's the movie? Are you doing a documentary about your life? No, John and I are hatching it out now. Uh huh. What's a great story? It's always the same. It's always a love story. <laughs> Even if you don't try. Well, we read your book, so we know you're a ladies' man. <laughs> Who are you to get off the treadmill, or who are you to think of yourself as pure? And that's what I, I wrote about. And I I said, I had to make a presentation in you know, a sample that for all, the, all the, the political correctness, all liberalism, there's less understanding between men and women than I ever remember. In other words, in the beginning, as bad as it was, with chauvinism and with discrimination and everything, you could make a separate piece with a girl. And now, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so it's very, uh, you know, you remember when Sinatra used to say, living well is the best revenge? Well, of course, just living is the revenge. But he took it all very seriously. The last custodian of romance. <laughs> It was great for you to come. That's great. Well, Appreciate it. It's wonderful to see you.